The experience of making Stop the Virgins, it just completely changed me as an artist. It was like the first time I'd made something that was so euphoric and so free of suffering or frustration or pain. So I was like, yeah, in my early 20s, and I was just like dark and you know stormy and twisted. And then I had this thing happen, making this music, which was so free of that. That's just the most amazing thing that has ever happened to me. We wrote Stop the Virgins, the music, in 2005. Me and Sam Spiegel got together um, after I moved to LA, and um, out of just having nothing really to do, he proposed that we just work on something. And the music just over like two weeks just came flowing out, almost just like kind of lightning, like conduit style. I think up until like a few years ago, literally only a handful of people had heard it. We all kept it under lock and key. But it was hard because I was so proud of it and I loved it so much and wanted to get it out there to, to the world. But uh, yeah, I just knew how precious it was to Karen. And incredibly personal song cycle for her, even though if you look at the lyrical content, I don't think you could go A, B, C, D, E, F, G and make a connected narrative. But just what it represents is an autobiographical emotional journey for her that's very, very raw and very, um, she's putting it all out there in that way. Stop the Virgin has been the, sort of the ace up my sleeve like for the last seven years, you know, I just, and simultaneously like the albatross around my neck, you know? <laughs> Cause, um, because it's hard to have something that you love so much that you're just kind of sitting on for years and years and years and not doing anything about it. But I knew that, you know, a day would come where, um, where we'd bring it to life. Every few months or so, I'd be, you know, we'd be talking and I'd be like, so what's going on with Stop the Virgins? And there was a bunch of different ideas and, and, and um, conceptual incarnations of the, how it would be released. What is this that you're setting up? This is the stage for this the first version ever of Stop the Versions, first version that will ever be seen. Maybe the only version. We don't know yet. And uh, this is the band. KK Barrett is a close friend of mine, and we have a really sen similar sensibility, even though you know he leans more towards high art and I lean t more towards um, trash. <laughs> trash art. Um, it's a good balance. Mythically, the story has the Virgins and all of the characters are originating from uh, space. 
And in the course of the songs, it's not as if they're bound in one place on Earth or one place in time in their story. Uh, we jump and advance the story and advance the story and advance the story. And they kind of hop through times and worlds. One idea was that Karen was the narrator of their story and the walls that they hit in life and lessons that they learned from them were taught to them by what we originally called cosmic nuns and now we're calling sentinels. Because they're kind of the, the figureheads of older womanhood or older lessons in life. Because when you're young and wild, you don't want to hear about any of that. And that's really what the show is about more than anything. It's just a moment in time. It's, it's a feeling. We all met up in Williamstown, Massachusetts for a week and did what we called band camp. And everybody just hung out and we all learned playing the songs together and, and kind of figured it out like, together like that. The time in Williamstown was really important in getting everybody synced up and on the same page and completely away from the distraction of their lives and of their work. And it really was just like an opportunity to focus and to commune together with the music and the, the project. So. <laughs> we thought it'd be fun and everyone would kind of have a blast and we'd kind of build our, our team spirit. The first part of the process which was really challenging for us was just recreating the sound of the original recordings, which is this very specific feeling and sound, and then being able to transform that to a way that works with this sort of theatrical, much more complex production that these guys are doing. I wanted to make sure that the design team was around that. Even just hearing the band working and hearing the bass line coming through the door, you know, does something to you when you're working. I thought like having the whole company together and being around the music was just a really um, good way to commune with the whole subject matter. So this is, this is where we did all our production and design meetings throughout the course of the week. Mike, that's, our, that's Mike, he's our uh, dramaturg. And that's the window I could look through and I could, see, I could see Money Mark on the keyboards, and uh, that was always a, always a, a spirit lifter. He's like a, a, a wise man and a child, like, combined, you know? Adam was a writer who had written a couple books and, and, and staged his own plays and was the director. She liked uh, the cathartic elements in his stories and the darkness in his stories, and... Uh, she thought that it was just a really good counterpoint to the kind of kind of sweetness that goes on here, even though there's a, there's a very a, a dark brooding element constantly threaded through. Because it was so abstract and because it was so shapeless and formless and we were really gonna find it, you know, um, in the rehearsal process, I felt like, you know, I was in good hands and, and I really trusted um, his ability to really rein it in and make it sort of, you know, refined and, and tight and most importantly, emotionally engaging. This is a breakdown of all the songs and sort of design costume references and design references and lighting, lighting references. And you can see the world, the color of the whole piece kind of across the top, song by song. This is one of my favorite pictures that KK came up with. There's these Darger references there. Darger's a real big influence on, on Karen. I really genuinely think that everybody not just likes the music, I think they love the music, and I think it all uh, reflects on Karen and how they feel about her, so. We're gonna, we're gonna 
be dealing with working with the music and the choreography kind of simultaneously. And then once we understand the physical world a little bit, we're going to integrate the music on top of it. And then we'll start moving into the band room as they get caught up to speed with the music. Because they've, they've, the band has already been with the music for a long time. And we were up at Williamstown for a week this summer. And by day five, they already had everything up, up to speed. They're incredible musicians. And what I want to do is integrate as quickly as we can. So as soon as we get, say, up to get them on the run, and we feel confident that we have something then we'll be playing with them in there. Adam comes from the theater world, and he's directing something where he's, he, he's a writer, and yet we've stripped all the words away from him. Uh, he can't have an actor enunciate and turn a point with, with a piece of dialogue where a word has two edges. And instead, he's got to just control the motions uh, through the players and their, and their body movements. I really don't think it's uh, as important, you know, their, their skill that they, they can present physically, but actually their will to go uh, through their own fears and, um, you know, that they're willing to struggle, you know, and go, go for it, you know, and it's much easier if everybody just is open to the game rather than struggling to be in it. I can write a book on Mari. What she accomplished with this you know, production was just like, it's, it's, it's unspeakable. I can't really put words to it. It's just like so amazing. first rehearsal day uh, when everyone was there to throw themselves into the project and it was like 40 women and I and we did this sort of improvisational thing with Mari. She kind of just gave vague directions of, of, of what people were supposed to do and then we all completely synchronized and it was the hive mind like immediately but the hive mind with like really high stake emotions you know. They ended up circling me and, you know, kind of picking me up and it felt like a ritual, you know, felt like a ritual sacrifice or something. People were crying. I mean, it was just, it was super intense. That's when it dawned on me that I've spent like about 10 years surrounded by like 95% men. <laughs> and here I am being encircled by like 40 plus, I mean, for like, you know, it was just, it was insane. I just, I, and it was of my making, you know, it's just like I'm the creator of this and that's when it dawned on me that everything has been leading up to, um, to balancing that, that 10 years out with this production. It's pretty unreal. Like there are so many times where I would just like stop and look around that room at all of these super talented, amazing musicians that have done great things. I just like floored by, I was like, how am I here right now? How am I a part of this thing? Cause this is like, this is ridiculous. The audience will walk into it like very um, confused and scared and uncomfortable, but then, um, you know, just be more and more entertained and enamored by everything going on. And uh, hopefully their hearts will be broken at the end. <laughs> too. Hopefully we'll get him with that because it's just such a beautiful cycle. It's the ride. Peace. She has a very laid back approach to rehearsals. 
She doesn't have any demands to make on anybody. She's just in the room, like encouraging everybody. And it's sort of incongruous with like the brilliant music that she's written, which is these songs. That's been really inspiring to know that like you can get 60 people in a room and you don't have to be a dictator. You just bring your positive energy and it happens. It's really cool. not like yeah. super, super tight, that's okay, right? Yeah, I used to work at the Daryl K store on 6th Street, um, just as like a shop girl, basically. And um, Karen used to come in all the time and um, just hang out, you know? And so we were kind of friends before Yeah Yeah Yeahs or started or I started my thing. So we kind of knew each other before. And then one day she came in and said, hey, I have a band, you should listen to my CD. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, you know, because a lot of times your friends will give you CDs and you're like, oh no, you know? And I listened to it and I was like, oh, this is really great. And then at the same time, I was kind of teaching myself how to like make clothes. And, and I had some with me one day and Karen saw them and she really liked them. She said, will you make one of these for, for me for uh, our next show? Right after that was when they suddenly just blew up. And then I just kind of be, by default became her costume designer, so it was fun. It was really cool the experience. Okay, one of the things that we're working on right now, or the interns are working on, are um, these sunglasses for for Black Book, and um, the, all the virgins will be wearing these. They're not going to be in paper, but basically they'll they'll turn around and they're going to have these sunglasses on. Um, so that's one of the things we're working on. This costume is um, get them on the run, and it's going to be all made out of hair. It's sort of that she's caught all these girls or in the past or before or like that she's cut them recently and that um she's wearing their hair so she's kind of going like you better listen to what i do or you're going to be turned into my outfit <laughs> you know so so that's sort of the idea the virgin's costumes are a little simpler like um they'll just be wearing sort of these circles so that when they they move they're really kind of able to move around a lot and they kind of catch air and are moving to me, it's it, it really does it represent you know Karen throughout her career you know sort of just being this total maniac on stage you know especially in the beginning and and just sort of like that like that whole idea behind the little circles was she used to just you know just have things and just be putting them on you know and, and they kind of be like falling half off or you know doing weird stuff or you know when she'd pour the beer all over herself so it's it's supposed to kind of represent her sort of in the beginning of of maybe just you know doing whatever she did where she just kind of went crazy and like put the pieces on 
I think she's a great artist. And I think she's really great about wanting to push the boundaries on things and stuff and not to stay in one spot or to kind of like, you know, just become, just be a rock star. St. Anne's is a warehouse. It's just a blank warehouse, 19 feet tall, about 100 feet long, that every time they do a show, it's reconformed. Uh, it's really a freeform sandbox for what anybody wants to do uh, for a live event. And this is the version for this space. And if it's done another time, it might be completely different. But this is specific to this place. How many days till the show? Uh, we got five, five days. We, we put together this in like a few months. We've got over a hundred people. And I mean, let's just say it's going very, very well. And you know, you've got people from all walks of life. We've got theater people, music, film. I mean, it's a really eclectic group and everyone, we're, we're a big family. Like, usually when you go to a uh, Yeah, Yeah, Yeah show, everyone knows all the hits, and uh, this is like, this is pure stuff, you know? This is like the first time anyone's ever gonna hear this, and it's gonna be live, not something that's coming out of a, you know, out of a MP3 player. Um, and I think that's a really, really pure, exciting thing. Everyone's been so concentrated on the details from the first day, sort of walking us through the narrative and making sure that we understand the story. And it's not just movement, it's not just song, it's not just pieces that they're strung together. Our first audience is a week from today. <laughs> hoo -ah. We'll be ready. I think it's, it's, it's going to move a lot of people and make people think about just the way that they make art or kind of take art in or take music in. Or, I think it's, it's going to expand the possibilities of what people think they can do and um, it's powerful stuff. So. We knew that we had done something amazing. We had become such a great family, and then it was all gonna be gone. I think that that made it so precious when we did it, that we knew that this is it.
I really wanted to, you know, make something that was kind of a unique live experience that I would want to see if, if I wasn't doing it, you know? Something with good music and emotionally engaging and, and like a bit of a spectacle, but, you know, but, you know, still kind of caught you here at times. I'm not a big theater person. I don't love musicals or plays, really. But this idea that we were kind of creating a, a unique experience that wasn't really easy to classify as far as any other shows I've ever seen or heard of, I think uh, that's what attracted me to it. I think it was just a uh, primordial soup type thing where you know it was all born of one one spirit, one mindset. Uh, there was nothing on the line, nothing to prove, and I think that's why it's so joyous and why it's so good. And yet it all seems to to belong together. I understand more about this music now, like seven years later, than I could possibly ever grasp when I made it. I was like, you know, that sort of age and that, at that point in my life of what a lot of the voices and the characters are. It just caught me at this moment in my life where I was just so completely open for this just to come through.